the Word today. We're winding up our annual series that we call God at the Movies. And uh, we're ending this series with an extremely powerful movie and theme today. The movie is called Beautiful Boy. The movie is the story of a father who did everything he could to deal with his son's drug addiction. I'm going to give you some perspectives on addiction today. But as I begin this message, I certainly want to begin this very kind of heavy theme with a word of hope. How many of you know there's always hope? Tell your neighbor, as long as there's God, there's hope. Tell that to your neighbor. As long as there's God, there's hope. And how many of you know God is eternal? He's, a, a, he's everywhere all the time, forever. So there's always going to be hope. And here's what I believe. I believe that whoever a person is, however deep they have fallen, however hopeless their situation may seem, we have a God who is big enough, powerful enough, loving enough to lift them up and help them recover. The arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot reach down to rescue, restore, and help anyone recover. Amen. I want to begin on an uplifting note. If you turn in your Bibles to Psalms 107, verses 19 and 20, I want to preach to you today uh, out of this text for just a moment. It says this, it says, uh, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. How many of you know that that's the answer right there? If you've got trouble, you've got difficulty, you've got distress, you've got problems, cry out to the Lord. It will make a difference. And it says this, and he saved them out of their distresses. How do you say the Lord has saved me out of some of my distresses? Come on, he's been good, right? He says, and he sent his word and he healed them. And I love this last verse part. It says, and delivered them from their destructions. From whose destruction? Their own destructions. The own things that they were doing that were destroying themselves. The scripture says they got delivered. They got set free. Come on. I believe that we serve a healing and delivering God who can take anyone and put them on the road to, dis to recovery. And, and I boldly declare that the person who can do this is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Come on. If you believe in Jesus, can you make a little noise in this house today. Amen. He's our source. He's our higher power. Well, let me introduce our movie for you today. By the way, we're preaching the Word, but illustrating the Word with various movie clips today, all right? Next week, we won't be doing this. This is our last Sunday. This is a true story that this movie is based on. Teenager Nicholas Sheff seems to have it all with good grades, being an actor, artist, athlete, and editor of the school newspaper. But when Nick's addiction to meth and f threatens to destroy him, his father does whatever he can to save his son and family. Now let me just give you a few thoughts about this movie. This movie's not really for little children, all right? Nor is this movie for people who struggle with listening to a curse word or two because there's numerous curse words in this movie. It's not a story about Christians, all right? It's a story of an upper-class middle family who discovered the pain around addiction. And rather than beginning at the beginning, we're going to go to the end and we're going to see the final scene of the movie, okay? Nick is a dark-haired young man who has a serious drug problem. You'll recognize him. And uh, at this point in the movie, he's been struggling for numerous years, seven, eight, nine years. And he has been in and out of rehabs for several years. He had been sober for a few months, and now he has relapsed, and he's in exceptionally deep. His girlfriend has overdosed. He's stolen from his parents. His parents have had to refuse him sanctuary because of his actions. And you will see in this first clip, you'll see Nick's father, whose name is David, and his second wife as they go seemingly, I believe, for the first time to a support group for parents of kids who are on drugs. And then a little later in this clip, you'll see Nick's dad embrace who Nick's mom, who was his, his first wife. And I want to warn you in advance, this is kind of a heavy scene, but uh, I think that it will set the tone for what we need to talk about.
flip, don't you agree? And uh, I know you might be thinking, man, I really didn't want to feel that way this morning. Uh, it produces something inside of you to watch a clip like that, I realize that, but sometimes it's our responsibilities as believers in Jesus Christ to understand the world around us, and sometimes feeling other people's pain is, is absolutely necessary, because I'm certain that within just a few miles of this church, there are people even today, even this morning, who are in great pain due to things that are similar to this. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, this doesn't affect me because, you know, I don't have that problem and I don't know anybody that has that problem, I would say very tenderly and kindly, that's probably not true. In the closing credits of the movie uh, that followed just that scene right there, they gave us the good news that Nick is now sober for eight years. Come on, that's good, right? But there's also the statement that drug overdose is now the leading cause of death in people under 50. Think about that for a moment. It's tempting for us as we watch a movie like this to say, well, you know, this movie is about them. But it's not about them. It's actually about us. Uh, it is actually could be a story of some in this congregation in the past. It's actually just a matter of degrees. One pastor of a mega church uh, who, who uh, also preached on this uh, very same uh, movie uh, took a survey of his staff and people who worked at the church. And they, they were about, uh, you know, about 75 people that took this kind of informal survey. And he asked them, and what, and, and, you know, he asked, how many of you in some ways is this your story? And to what is your degree of separation? It was kind of an informal survey. And, of course, if you were the addict or are the addict, you have zero separation. If you have someone in your family, you know, that your close family, there's one degree. If you have a grandchild or a niece or a nephew, there's two degrees. If you have a friend, that's three degrees of separation. And amazingly, that survey came back and said, you know, these are people that all work in a church, okay? 85% said they are just one degree away. Wow. Uh, there are many people who, uh, if, if you would be honest, you would say, you know, that was me. <laughs> or there are others who could say, you know, that could have been me, but for the grace of God. And, and I know that this is a personal thing for many, but I, I tell you what I don't believe. I don't believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be silent about these issues. Amen? In fact, I believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be the one shouting out that we have the answer. Come on, do you believe that God can help? Do you believe that He can? And in no way should the church ever, ever, ever be throwing stones at people who suffer like this. Because the truth is all of us, you and me, all of us have done things to try to eliminate the stress in our lives and to try to cope with life. It may not have been drugs, but it might have been an affair. It might have been escaping into TV. It might be pornography. It might be anger that causes problems in the family. It might be distancing yourself and isolating yourself. It might be overeating or going to the club or, or getting drunk or workaholism or overspending and, and shopping or, or some other way that, that, that people have to soothe themselves. So I don't believe that the church ought to throw stones. If you believe that, just give the Lord a big praise. Come on. You say, well, I don't have any addictions. Well, you might not have any addictions, but you might have some compulsions. Hello? <laughs> you might have a weakness. You might have a struggle. Is there anybody who would say, yes, I can relate to some of this? Come on. So this morning I want to give you three perspectives, and I believe that they're really important perspectives that we need to rethink as a church. Some of us might need to have our minds readjusted a little bit this morning. And the first perspective comes from a scene when Nick is, is, is graduating from high school and he's with his dad. And here's the point I want to make. I'm going to make it before, during, and after, all right? David, I mean, Nick's dad is blissfully unaware of all that has been happening in his young son's life. And uh, this scene in the movie actually takes place just immediately after 
Nick has graduated from high school, right? And there's dad with all of his hopes and ambitions, and, and he's spending some quality time with his son. And uh, I, I want you to see, see what transpires here. And remember that he's unaware. Nick's dad is unaware. Uh, just to be fair to uh, Nick's dad here, it's my understanding that he actually really regrets that moment in his life. And, you know, a, you know, a young person might think, well, that's a really cool dad, you know, but uh, I can tell you that David Sheff regrets that day. So let me give you perspective number one today, all right? You can jot this down or it's in your notes. We need to have a wartime mentality. We need to see ourselves in a war with evil and sin and, yes, even the devil. And uh, we need to see ourselves in a war here. And let me just be super clear here. Nick's dad is in a war, and he doesn't even know it yet. Am I right? Now, Nick's dad was not in a war with Nick. But nonetheless, the truth is there were sinister, evil forces that were out to destroy Nick, and his dad was completely oblivious. You know, I'm not talking about some political war on drugs or something like that, and certainly you and I, we're not in a war with people who use drugs, but the truth is that we are in a war with sin and with evil and even with the devil. And let me just, uh, I want to read you a scripture today about reality, because if you noticed in that clip, Nick was one, he wanted to escape reality. But how many of you know there's a funny thing about reality? It's there if you like it, and it's there if you don't. Reality is just reality. If you don't find reality pleasant, doesn't matter. It's still reality. If you find it unpleasant, doesn't matter. It exists whether you agree with it, recognize it, or stick your head in the sand and pretend it does not exist. And here is the reality of Nick's situation according to the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Whether you realize it or not, my friend, evil spirits, satanic forces are involved in all of these things. And Satan's goal is very plain according to the scripture. He is there. He wants to kill. He wants to rob. And he wants to destroy and what is interesting is that Nick's dad soon is going to be in an all-out war trying to save his son's soul. And I am sure that it must have cost him thousands of dollars. I know that it produced stress in his home and in his marriage. It distracts him from his two other beautiful children. He's fighting for his son's very life. And it's, it's like a lot of wars, my friend. You are in it a while before you even realize you're in it. We can go back in history, all you World War II fans and people who have lived through that, and you remember that December 7th, 1941, there was an attack on Pearl Harbor, right? And uh, they bombed our ships and our fleet, and they bombed the city, and then all of a sudden, the next day, we were in a war. But let me tell you something. I believe that we were in a war before December 7th, 1941, because somebody was plotting and planning our demise and our destruction and our overthrow. And so we have to realize, my friend, that we are in a battle zone. We're in a war. And you may be in a war today and don't even know it. Let me read for you a verse, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 11. This is what the Word says. It says, Beloved, I, be I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. In other words, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who are looking for that eternal city. He says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which do what? They war against the soul. Now, this is a concept in our culture that you know, when I was a young man, this used to be widely accepted as real wisdom. But today, you know, people kind of even have a hard time grasping the meaning of this. But the word fleshly lust there is very descriptive.